fourth watch starts now. Everybody, you're listening to the Fourth Watch with Justin Fall on the Fourth Watch Radio Network. I hope everyone's having a blessed week. Tonight, we embark on a long-awaited journey into the depths of Atlantis and many elements that surround this ancient topic. We'll be excavating the history and hashing through the myths and realities with archaeology and biblical comparison. Is it possible that the end times world system of the Antichrist? will be a revived and new Atlantis? This is just one aspect we'll definitely be investigating tonight. We've got a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and start the adventure. Submitted for the approval of the 4th Watch Radio Network, I call this episode Atlantis, The Watchers, Nephilim, and the Antediluvian Revival with special guest Gary Wayne. Well, it's Thursday again, and I am so excited to be back with you all, and we have quite an adventure for you tonight. I want to say a big thank you once again to everyone who's been so gracious to give and further the good fight of the Fourth Watch Ministries, and I pray that the Lord would multiply your gifts back unto each of you richly. If you're feeling led to help support this ministry, you can head on over to fourthwatchradio.blogspot.com. That's the number 4, T-H-W-A-T-C-H, R-A-D-I-O dot B-L-O-G S-P-O-T dot com. That's fourthwatchradio dot blogspot dot com. There you can easily give by clicking the PayPal donate button on the right side of the screen. If you would rather mail your love gifts and support, you can write to Justin Fall, J-U-S-T-E-N-F-A-U-L-L, Fourth Watch Ministries, that's all spelled out, F-O-U-R-T-H-W-A-T-C-H, Ministries, P.O. Box, 1145, Snellville, Georgia, 30078. That's Snellville, S-N-E-L-L-V-I-L-L-E, Georgia, 30078. All gifts should be made out to the order of Justin Fall. We truly appreciate your support as we're growing and reaching more people each week. Now, if you're a new listener, we're very grateful to have you tuning in, and we want to let you know that there's a brand new show posted every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard on the 4th Watch Spreaker page, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com, Spreaker dot com. There you can search the fourth watch or Justin Fall. You can go to the fourth watch blogspot page mentioned earlier. You can also go to the Justin Fall YouTube channel or you can subscribe for auto download in iTunes. Now, I recommend that everybody just easily download the fourth watch app for your smartphones and mobile devices for free. And this way you're going to have the easiest listening experience on the go. If you want the app, just search Justin Fall in your app stores for Apple and Android. I'm also pleased to announce that FourthWatchRadio.com will be officially launching soon and will be a one-stop hub for your Fourth Watch experience. So praise God. Now tonight we'll be taking a trip into the antiquity of one of the most controversial and confusing topics of the antediluvian world. And who better to go with than my good friend Gary Wayne. For those who aren't familiar with Gary, he is a seasoned Christian researcher who has compiled more than 30 years of work into his masterpiece, Genesis 6 Conspiracy, which is a must-have book for all Christian researchers out there. Be sure to check out his website, Genesis6Conspiracy.com. That's Genesis number 6, Conspiracy.com. Now, with that said, we want to go ahead and welcome on Gary Wayne. Gary, welcome back to The Fourth Watch. How are you tonight? Very good. So happy to be back on the fourth watch and uh, to be talking with you, Justin. And uh, I know you've got a a show lined up on Atlantis, and I've been very, very excited and anxious for this day to come so that we could do this show and talk about hopefully some things about Atlantis and the antediluvian world that, you know, perhaps people haven't thought about or they may want to dig deeper into because, you know, I just find it such a fascinating subject. It really is, Gary. It's one of those topics that there's so much controversy surrounding it. And I sit back and say, let's just put the controversy aside. Why can't we just have a discussion about the claims? It was always fascinating to me, even as a child. And here we are now 
Um, with so much research under our belts and so many years have passed since we've started talking about Atlantis and our personal dialogues. And I just, I'm excited. I think this is going to be a great discussion. You even devoted a chapter in Genesis 6 Conspiracy to Atlantis. And for those of you listening who have Genesis 6 Conspiracy, you can open it right up to chapter 17 and you can read some of Gary's research on this. But because Gary only covered one chapter on Atlantis, we decided we were going to come together and just do a full discussion because this is so much that we could talk about. Well, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I have one chapter that's devoted to Atlantis, but there's a few other chapters that uh, I have in there as well that sort of expand on it, whether it's the seven sages after the Atlantean disaster or it's the echoes that sort of hit the other um, cultures around the world uh, that stem out of Atlantis that we're going to get into. And actually, you know, Atlantis, even though I don't always talk about it in the book, it is such a significant part of the polytheist belief systems and the polytheist legends and religions that it is actually part of the worldwide legacy that uh, all other cultures have. And again, whether or not we want to recognize it as being part of the blood narrative as monotheists or not, we need to recognize it has pretty much an identical narrative as what the the flood story has in Genesis, only again from, as I mentioned, a polytheist perspective. So I think we can uh, talk about it in terms of another perspective on the flood story and connect it to so much other mythology that's out there uh, about Atlantis without worrying about disturbing uh, what it says in Genesis, because again, Genesis is going to be our measurement stick and what we weigh everything against. But I don't find that any of this has a lot to do with what Genesis says, although I'll grant you that sometimes my uh, understanding of Genesis might uh, differ from um, what other people might think. So yeah, let's get into it. Like what you said, that's that's our measuring stick. The Word of God is our measuring stick. That's our standard. But while that was going on, There were other things going on in different parts of the world that were not recorded in the Bible, and that's where we get our different views from around the world. But again, as long as we use the scripture as our measuring stick, I am, I love digging into these things. And, uh, you know, I had a Bible chart that, uh, that I bought a while back, and it's it's a fold out Bible chart, and it shows the timeline of what happened in the Bible. And then when you go down, you just kind of look down underneath it, and there's a parallel timeline of things that were going on in other parts of the world that other cultures recorded. So again, you know, some people might want to consider this a pseudographical discussion, <laughs> but really, I just want to get that out there because you, you said it so eloquently that the Bible is our measuring stick, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with us. Because, Gary, you and I both, we are contrarians. We like to bring up discussions that might be contrary to what many people believe. So, yeah, anyway, let's get into the archaeological aspect first. I definitely want to tap into the mythological aspects because I think those are those are very interesting, but... From an archaeological perspective, let's let's go to the origins. Well, from an archaeological perspective, and I'm sure many of your listeners may be aware of this, but if those who aren't, the first thing I think people have to be open to when we talk about Atlantis is that there are underwater cities, submerged cities, uh, all around the globe off of almost every continent. And they have an age that dates anywhere from, you know, 5,000 years to uh, 12,000 years uh, when when they were built as best as they can um, identify those. So I think the notion that, and again, whether or not we totally agree with how science uh, dates uh, the history, whether it's carbon dating or layering or whatever else that they want to do to identify how old they think things are, I think we have to look at the trend line and see how that matches up with what it might say in the Bible. And so these ancient cities um, are inexplicable. They are unaccountable, and even secular science isn't wanting to, and archaeology is not wanting to deal with this in um, a significant way because it totally alters the propaganda and the timeline that they've already presented. And yet, so this rewrites the secular and poly, not the polytheist, but the secular perspective of, of archaeology and science, but not necessarily, not necessarily the religious perspective. And you know, probably 
Um, you know, everybody's heard of the Azores that, if, you know, uh, people thought maybe Atlantis is there and there's all these different locations. And I'm going to come back to, um, well, maybe I should put this out on the table first before I zero a little bit more on Atlantis is in the antediluvian world, there was anywhere from, from polytheist in mythology, anywhere from four great civilizations to as many as nine. And I only include nine because of, I know there's so many fans out there of the Game of Thrones, and Thrones is just another word for uh, authority or uh, kingship, and it's in the Bible as Thrones, principal, <coughs> excuse me, principalities. Um, you know, there are archons. There were the celestial mafia that had these these cult centers, and the most that I have from, let's say, from Enoch and some other a uh, little bit more closely related to monotheism. Uh, accounts would be seven cult centers that begin somewhere around 10 to 12,500 BC, where the gods or the fallen angels built these cult centers with great temples and pyramids and things like that, which is why we see them all around the world. And to as little as four civilizations, um, which is more common in the Atlantean um, mythologies in maybe some of the New Age mythologies. And so some of the names that people will be familiar with uh, these civilizations would be, of course, Atlantis and Sumeria is two of them. Uh, Mu would be uh, a, another one. Um, and so certain names like that, even Lemuria, but Lemuria is more looked upon as the motherland of, of these first civilizations. But again, that really gets deep into uh, theosophy, uh, religion, and mythology. And certainly parts of Egypt, and there's a lot of Speculation whether Egypt was a separate empire in the antediluvian world or was it just a satellite country of, of uh, Atlantis. So I already mentioned we've got locations around the world uh, with submerged cities. And people are familiar with Bimini and Azores and all of these different speculations. And the reason why they tend to look more into Ed the Atlantic Ocean is it goes back to Plato's account in uh, Critias and Timaeus, where he said that Atlantis was located beyond the pillars of Hercules. Now, people like to reinvent what the pillars of, Her of Hercules are when they're wanting to, wanting to locate Atlantis, let's say at Santorini or around Crete or around Manoa, which also had ancient cities and ancient submerged cities, which is part of what I was talking about earlier. But the pillars of Hercules in the ancient world, were known to be beyond what we would know today as the rocks of Gibraltar and that inlet that goes into the Mediterranean Sea from the Atlantic Ocean. So somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. And again, according to Plato and other ancient writers, it was somewhere northwest off the North African coast. And I'm going to give you later, and I'll finish up with some of the names of the countries and how they link back to Atlantis uh, later on. So most people look in Atlantis, and I know some people will even look as far below as Antarctica, uh, that they believe that there was some sort of uh, crust shift that moved uh, uh, Atlantis and the destruction down to Antarctica and it submerged below the ice. And certainly there's ancient maps that show, a civil, uh, show the island of Antarctica or the continent of Antarctica that is a total mystery as to how they would know that. But, again, most are looking into the Atlantic Ocean. And, um, you know, there's, and I think people are even familiar with Edward Casey, who thought that Atlantis would be discovered late in the 2000s, or around the 2000 area, or, or, or early on into this millennia. But there was an interesting discovery in it was actually made in the 1960s, and uh, they laid off of it because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that's when it was actually covered, and they didn't want this information to fall into the Russian government's hands. And so what's going on now is, is sort of a revisitation to that site just off of Cuba in the Yucatan Channel, just uh, t between sort of Cuba and, and the Yucatan. And there's uh, two scientists, I think the names are Paul... Uh, Weinwig and Pauline Zalitsky. And uh, this, these are all of these fabulous pictures of this gigantic city complex 
that's located underwater with four pyramids and there's sphinxes and uh, they, they, these, the, the size of the rocks are just, are, you know, used for the construction is incredible. There's roads, they're even saying there's tunnels and one of the pyramids is a crystal pyramid that they say is larger than the one in Egypt. So we'll have to wait for information to come back on this, but it is certainly in the right area. And when we link it into the Central and South American and the North American mythologies, perhaps a little bit later, it makes a lot of sense that it might be there. So if this is not Atlantis, it is another unaccounted for uh, submerged city that dates back uh, about 10,000 years. Uh, again, so that kind of uh, matches up with some of these cities being built by the uh, Watchers in around 10,000 BC. And we're dealing with similar technologies. And, and we're dealing with similar technology, absolutely, which is so key because um, in case people aren't aware of it, uh, I believe, and uh, all the research that I've done leads me to conclude that the technology and the knowledge level in the pre-flood world was as great as we have today and perhaps greater so but our technology and and knowledge is developing so rapidly we'll probably catch up and it will be exactly like the days of Noah um, once we catch there and there's also writing that they're seeing on these rocks that um, are very similar to hieroglyphs they haven't decoded them they're not saying they're exactly like hieroglyphs but they're very very much related and again that would make sense if Egypt uh, was part of the Atlantean Empire. So that, that, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Um, and so there are so many sites and things that people are saying where Atlantis is. For me, this is sort of the most likely one because it was discovered by the U.S. government. And uh, it's been known about, and now we're getting actual pictures from it. So uh, for me, that's the, uh, that's the best case for... Uh, Atlantis today. But whether or not that turns out to be Atlantis or not, um, Atlantis is larger than the archaeology of it. It's, it's, it's uh, so, sort of the, encapsulates the whole story of prehistory. Um, there's another place that um, people, uh, National Geographic is covering off recently, and I think is starting in about 2011 or so. That's just off of the coast of Spain, um, north of Cadiz. And it's a submerged city, and uh, there's a lot of connections there in terms of the archaeological discoveries that they're bringing up that connects it to Greek and Atlantean mythology. And so they're thinking that's the location of, of, of Atlantis, um, which, again, is possible, but more probably more as one of the satellite empires or one of the satellite countries as opposed to the exact location, because Atlantis was so much bigger than than just this one uh, one country or continent. And there's a map in the 1600s done by Kircher uh, that places, uh, and, and he, he said he got his information from ancient maps and, and ancient information that places uh, Atlantis right in the middle of, of the Atlantic Ocean between you know Spain and, and Cuba and a, and a fairly large continent. So, just just a thought. You mentioned uh, possibly satellite countries. Um, what's interesting about this is when we get back to we go back in history to Babylon and Babylon was obviously uh, according to biblical history, Babylon would have been like the original, quote unquote, new world order or the one world, the, the epicenter of the world uh, that was trying to spread its power and, and basically rule all of the, the cities and the countries. So if we go back further, you know, putting putting Babylon aside and going back further on the timeline. Basically, what we're looking at here is that there could have been this this epicenter of Atlantis, and we're going to get into the mythology of that here in a little bit. But you have the the main epicenter and you know the pinnacle right there, and then you have these satellite countries that are basically run by the Atlantean culture, spoke the Atlantean language, operated with Atlantean technology. Is that kind of what we're we're looking at here potentially? Yes, that's what we're talking about. It and uh, the, and. The Atlantean ideology and notion and, and, and mythological aspect of it has it operating like an antediluvian world empire, much like what was trying to happen in Babylon and empires past and what will happen in the end time. And it's very much an allegory for the end time in so many ways as well. Um, but what's important to know is, is, is that there was 10 
uh, nations or groups of nations that were part of the Atlantean Empire, and the Atlantic uh, Atlantis Island was one of those. It was the capital center, and it was known for the helm of world government, and it was on a path to try and take the whole world over, whole world over through uh, military force and through the Titans. That's why I call it the Nephilim World Order, and the kings were, were Titans and Nephilim. But they were defeated by the Athenians and Hercules. And so um, they didn't quite get that done. And so some of the nations, if people are wondering where some of these nations were, so it would include, you know, Northwest Africa in two different segments that would include like Libya and Egypt. It would include uh, the other parts of Northwest Africa, which had Morocco involved with it and right sort of around that whole corner. Um, It included Southwest Europe, including Spain and Southwest France and as far over as Italy. It included England, Scotland, and the British Isles, and some people think even further up into Iceland and more towards Sweden and Norway, but I don't have anything to confirm that. It also included the various islands within the ocean that are off the west coast of Europe and Africa. It also included the Yucatan of South America and other parts of of Central America and parts of South America that would be more in the northern part of South America. Uh, And it would, uh, see, did I get them all? I think so. I think that's pretty much most of the geography that was included in it. So this was a very, very large large world empire in the making uh, in, in the antediluvian mythology. Now, when we go to all these different sites, like let's just say that we go out and we, we've got the budget, we're traveling around to all these different sites that are part of uh, the original Ten Kingdoms. Uh, interestingly, I, I do want to get into the idea later in the show about the Ten Kingdoms and like what you said about a parallel with the end time system. But you, we go to these ten, these ten sites, we're going to find... Rock formations, crop circle type. I, I, even today, there's crop circles showing up in some of these places. I, I know this for a fact. Um, but we see rock formations. We see stone circles, uh, which are used for not only rituals and sacraments, but they're also used for um, different types of, uh, of calendars, like uh, astral calendars. Or I, I could be getting the title wrong. Maybe it was the solar calendar. But we're dealing with all these different types of antediluvian technology. In all these different sites, even on the surface of what we know to be the the globe today. Yeah. That's what's blowing my mind here because all the sites you named off, there's culture that we can go look into and they've even got remnants of these things on the surface today, not just underwater, but on the surface. That's the thing to keep in mind is is that even though we're mystified and we're talking today about submerged cities in, in Atlantis, whether or not you go into Machu Picchu or you go into some of these other sites that are ancient, and they all said it was built by the builder gods or the senior ones or whatever the allegory for the, these ancient ones who built them. It's all part of the same mythology. It's all part of the same history and seemingly with related cultures and languages and gods. So I think there's there's a consistency there that makes... Uh, a, well, it makes a lot of sense that there's some, there's more to it than uh, somebody just coming up and, and trying to speculate and, and, you know, just connect dots. Because what we're doing, we're connecting, but we're connecting the history because this is what these tribes and peoples and religions think. This is actually their history. We're tying different people's histories together with archaeology and the Bible, and we're finding it's telling the same story. That's too much of a coincidence. Me. Just to show you how some of these connections work. So everybody's familiar with the country called Ethiopia, but that's on the uh, east coast of Africa. But what people don't know is Ethiopia originally was not located there, and it sort of was moved there, or the name changed during the Marentian Empire, as, as, as I recall. But the ancient Greeks knew Ethiopia as Adiops, and Adiops was the mountain of serpents, which was located in northwest Africa, which is Adiops is the sort of the original name for Ethiopia. And they believed that Adiops was part of and the surviving part of the Atlantean Empire. 
And again, so you have an entomology that connects us back as well, that goes out through history that is sort of inexplicable. Now, what, what, do you believe that it was possible that that place was set up with serpents to protect something, some knowledge that they didn't want man to find? Well, yeah, I mean, when we're talking about, again, it's the mountain of serpents, right? So it goes back to these seven sacred mountains, right? And, and then the mountains of the seraphim angels who had the serpent light look and the, and the titans and the Nephilim who look just like them. So the serpent allegory that is connected throughout the world and through everything in Atlantis or the dragon allegory is is a significant part of this whole understanding of it. And I want to throw one other historian in before we move on. And you may have heard of uh, Belisar, or maybe more commonly known as Barossus, one of these famous ancient writers that was commissioned by um, uh, the Greeks just after Alexander died to record the history of of ancient Mesopotamia and Babylon, and, and just as Ptolemy uh, uh, commissioned uh, Manatheo, if I pronounce that, that Manatheo, some people will pronounce it as, and just as Romans commissioned Josephus to keep the, the ancient Hebrew history alive, this was a common practice to keep the ancient history flowing. So this was a priest out of the Temple of uh, Belus, and uh, his name is either Belisar Barossus, depending on which language you're uh, translating from, and he wrote a book about uh, Bab- called Babylonica, which was the history of, of Babylon. And he said that the original people who named their city Babylon named it Babylon as a reference and an allegory and a memorial to uh, the and a replacement for for the first city of the world, the city of cities that was destroyed by the flood, which I believe and Barossa's believe was Atlantis. Now, here, here's just a question. To, and again, this is this is going to be a question where there, there's going to be speculation involved. But in thinking about these cities that are underwater, that we're finding right now, where, you know, the explorers are finding these cities and they're able to go down with dive teams. Um, is it possible that the underground base phenomena that we hear about, the underground alien bases, as some people like to call them, uh, again, obviously you and I would hold a different view as to the aliens being the fallen angels, but the fallen angels having underground bases, underwater bases that we hear about, is it possible that some of these bases are nothing more than antediluvian cities that, they've, that they're operating in? Yeah, I think that's uh, highly possible, and... You know, there's a whole mythos out there that suggests that that's what they did, and they went underground, whether it's North American or it's some of the Nephilim uh, mythology that's out there. Of course, along that sort of lines, there's this idea that they put these uh, Nephilim in stasis, and uh, the other beings that, you know, would be some of the lizard people or some of the little people are guarding them for the end time. That's not where I'm going with that, but as a possibility, and just sort of make a link to that's I think where some of this mythology comes from is is it is highly possible that some of these cities did survive, except that we have to remember, though, that in the other accounts, and even in the Bible I can make some reference to 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 widen the story of what the flood is, this was a horrific catastrophe that was more than just water bubbling up from the storage wells below the surface. This was earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, landmass being shifted up and down and turning everything upside down and meteor strikes. So um, it's probably more likely if that's what was, was going on, they've been rebuilt, but they would have had the technology to be able to do that. But I do want to refer to uh, Ezekiel 26 on that one for people um, who may want to go and check that verse where it's talking about in ancient times, uh, the people, um, you know, when, when everything, when the earth was laid barren, people were, were dwelling underground. So you may want, I mean, it's a very odd one, and, and it's part of that connection to that, that um, verses that are describing uh, uh, Satan. So there's something to the effect of something underground because um, there's, you know, it's, you know, like it says, people of long ago who dwell in the earth in ancient ruins, just kind of paraphrasing as it comes into my head. So... Uh, that's a possibility. I, I, I don't have anything to assert that that's actually true, but it certainly uh, certainly uh, points in that direction that that's a possibility. You're going back to the mythos that, that are teaching that 
it was more than just a flood. I mean, in the event of the flood, there was just much cataclysmic destruction taking place, which could lead us to the idea that rocks fell and that certain cities would now be, I mean, thousands of years later, of course, uh, some of these cities would be underground, not necessarily underwater, but underground. Yeah. And when you get over into Mexico, Mexico has such a rich history, in my opinion, in dealing with the Watchers. Yes. And you get to Mexico, and there's certain writings from Mexican culture, some of the uh, Indio mexican uh, tribes, and they talk about entrances into the earth that take us down into cities, which lead, you know, you get to a certain place underground, and then you've got to go into water, and then you get through the water, and you come back up underground, still underground, but now you're not underwater, and there were there, there's a lot of parallels between some of the Mexican lore, the Mexican Indian lore, and the the lore that we hear coming from Greek mythology about going down to the underworld. And so I'm kind of fascinated with that idea because you're dealing with not just under underground, but you're dealing with underground and then underwater and then out of water and under more ground. All of which is why I don't rule it out completely. Uh, I can't substantiate it, but there are connections there. And again, if you get into the Atlantean mythology. And after the rebellion, the Titans who rebelled, they are put away into um, a place, a prison called Tartarus, which is thought to be in the earth. And Tartarus is another name for abyss that Peter uses in some translation of, of the first book of Peter, as I recall, um, where it could say Tartarus or it could say abyss. And again, I, I, I look at it as water, I look at uh, a shaft in the earth for where the abyss might be, and I look at Tartarus, and I say, there's too much of a connection there that suggests that there isn't something that goes on underneath the earth. But again, I don't have enough to be, you know, particularly, you know, uh, determined and definite on that. But I, I do like the uh, the research and the the ideology of that. There's something going on below the earth. And I definitely, uh, that's one of the topics that I'm, I've done so much research on is getting into the idea of the hollow earth. Uh, I believe we can biblically substantiate this theory uh, along with the cultures of the world and the writings and, and the beliefs of these polytheist religions. Um, because at some point it appears that the fallen angels, the watchers, that they entered into the earth, not to say that they're stuck there, but to say that they had access into the earth. And many of the cultures say that they would come up they would create the Nephilim offspring, create more Nephilim, and then they would go back down into the earth where they had their kingdom or whatever you would want to call it, their lair. And then the Nephilim were, were basically ruling the earth for them, and they would only come to the surface for certain rituals and ceremonies and meetings, basically. And again, this is just getting into some of the cultures. You know, I mean, you've got this showing up in Europe. It is. Well, whether or not it comes from, uh, you know, Zeptepi motherland uh, from the Book of Toth, and they talk about portals or it comes from the Tartarus idea and the Tuatha Dé Danann and going to the other world or the netherworld or Anwin and back and forth between these portals, or you have the fairy domains that are located all around the world, which kind of look like little huts of mini Stonehenge sort of buildings, but domain stands for portal, and they call them fairy portals. Uh, in the fairy mythology, which I've talked about in other shows with you, that there's a gray uh, alien that has flying machines and kidnaps people and does DNA experimentations and think it was a gray alien abduction if you saw one of those descriptions. Uh, also come through shays or fairy mounds or portals and also out of the water and portals and an allegory for that is the ladies of the lake which are fairies because fairies are all part of the, the fae group in, in King Arthur and then they're in the lakes guarding these portals and that these fairy ladies, uh, fairies were um, sent to guard the portals to the other world. It's all part of the Gnostic religions. There is such a rich and detailed narrative from so many different aspects of religion and mythology that one has to kind of think there's something to this, to the portals to the underworld, or is it to another dimension? You, you pick your choice, or maybe it's both, but there's, there's something here that... Um, we need to look deeper at and, and understand better, I think. I think I think you're exactly right. I just personally I do believe that it's both. I believe we're not we're dealing with underworld extra dimensions. I, I really do believe it's both. But I, I think that all these things that we're discussing, I think there are extra dimensional 
qualities and characteristics involved. It's, it's hard for us to really wrap our head around sometimes, but I think the more we learn about physics, I think it makes more sense that we're dealing with dimensions and all of these things. And whether or not you know science is even close to answering the question or not of with uh, quantum physics and string theory and multiple dimensions that they would suggest by theory there are uh, infinite amount of dimensions and, and quantum possibilities. Um, I'm not convinced of that, but there are, we already know there are different sort of dimensions from two dimension to three dimension and possibly time. And, and we know from just a religious aspect that the spirit realm um, is, is a different dimension, if we want to call it that, than what we're uh, in the physical realm. So I think there's, 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 again, more to it, and we need to be open but not deceived as to what some of these things might be. One thing I love, Gary, is when we come together is we can, we can discuss some of the hard questions because I get a lot of emails, as do you, and I don't mind addressing some of these questions with theories. But again, sometimes, like you said, you know, we can't make a definite statement as to this is a fact or this is a theory. But in getting into the idea of the Nephilim, because I, I just I keep going back to this idea of these underwater cities and even the the capabilities of the Nephilim. Now, uh, BDK and I, we are very much in agreement that the Nephilim, and I know we've talked about this with you, that the Nephilim were reptilian. They had reptilian qualities, or some say the serpentine qualities. Uh, we know that serpents can go underwater for extended periods of time. Um, I also believe that the Nephilim are, they have extra dimensional qualities because they've got qualities of angels and they've got qualities of man. I, again, we're dealing with hybrids here. Some people have a hard time, you know, accepting these ideas. But all you have to do is you look at the at the father and the mother and you say, well, you're going to have characteristics of both. And so angels are extra dimensional. Angels don't die. Uh, obviously, the Nephilim die because they are of man. But the idea that a Nephilim would have the characteristics uh, of angels um, and even early in the early down the generational scale, we're also dealing with reptilian qualities. So I kind of lean to the idea that it's possible that Nephilim, even modern day Nephilim, depending on their their pedigree, would be able to live underwater for a certain amount of time, or at least spend a, a certain amount of time underwater. What are your thoughts on that? Without going too crazy, because I know I know that's probably we didn't discuss this previously. I don't want to throw a curveball at you, but I just I wanted to throw that out there because I know there's people out there thinking it. So the first thing is is that um, they did have the characteristics, and even in the Atlantean mythology, that uh, the, of what their fathers looked like. And again, we talked about the seraphim angels who had the face of a snake and looked like a dragon with the wings, and they were shining opalescent beings. And so, in the Atlantean mythology, uh, whether it comes from Greek, Egyptian, Central American, or North American, they all agree that they were white. Um, they agree that they had red hair or blue hair. That they had rough white, ruddy skin, their eyes glowed, they had high cheekbones, and they looked like snakes. Um, so there's a, this, there's a, a serpent-like quality that they certain, certainly inherited from a physical aspect. So again, why wouldn't they um, have other aspects that perhaps is changeling quality or perhaps skills because they were some sort of reptilian or fish-like? And when you get into the Sumerian description of the original senior ones that are coming in, they, they are the Oannes, which were a fish-like god, right? Still look serpent-like, but they said they went back into the sea all the time and came back out. So again, um, this is Oannes also started the seven sages in Sumeria, which is the Sabeti, which is the same as the Shebtu and the seven sages around the world that people of mythology or, you know, the seven rishi out of India would be would recognize that Enoch the evil is connected to be Oannes, not Oannes the original god, but Oannes from the followers of Oannes and takes on that name as well. So, and then there's a, a, a an etymology connection that I'll show between Oannes and Enoch in, in in my book. But there is a connection there, and just as uh, as uh, Zeus is sometimes portrayed in a fish-like or lizard-like or reptilian or a snake-like. Um, form. Uh, this is not sort of an, uh, a total, like it's, in, like it's a total impossibility. It is certainly possible that they would have some of those attributes that their parents did. There's no doubt about it. It's just which ones are they? And when we get into the idea of Dagon, um, you know, I've, I've done a breakdown of Dagon before getting into the story of Jonah from an archaeological standpoint, from a, a religious standpoint. 
uh, getting into the polytheist uh, views of Dagon. But Dagon was a fish man. And I, the more I think about it, you know, obviously there's only two options for Dagon. He was either a fallen angel that had the changeling quality or he was a Nephilim hybrid. Because we do know that the Nephilim hybrids Could were be worshipped. And here's a little bit more of a connection. So Dagon is, is the god that the Philistines uh, bring in. And they come in from Crete and uh, Cyprus uh, in, in the Mediterranean Ocean. So now we're, we've got a Greek connection uh, with a Poseidon-like god, just as most people think Oannes and Poseidon are the same god, right? So whether or not they were actually fish-like or not, or it's an allegory of the god of the sea as opposed to the god of the sky, which Zeus would have been in Greek mythology, right? Uh, I think they're talking about the same god, and they're talking about the same mystical religion in Atlantis, which was the Enochian mysticism uh, that Sumeria had. I think they all had the same religion around the world. Uh, they just had different gods running the different cult centers, but they had a very similar and pretty much identical uh, pantheon. Now, you're saying that it's very possible that that's the same god as Poseidon. Yes, because Oani starts the ten, and ten is an uh, antediluvian constant as a number, but ten kingships. They're called the Pishtun uh, kingships, which is so very close in its pronunciation to Poseidon, right? So I think, I think it is the same. This opens up the discussion, kind of leads us into the area of uh, the mythos around Atlantis as the actual continent, the epicenter, and now you've told me before, and you've outlined this previously, that Poseidon is known as the god of Atlantis when Atlantis was flourishing. It was the god, and that was his cult center, yes. So that would have been, he would have technically been what Nimrod was to the post-flood world. Yeah, essentially, essentially, although I would raise Poseidon higher than Nimrod. Um, I would raise, because he's so high up in the pantheon, I would certainly insist that he was one of the more senior watchers running the, the, the cult centers, um, and he was certainly in Greek mythology equal to Zeus, right? So again, you have this constant in, in, in polytheism where you have two gods. One is a good god, and Zeus is considered a good god and the sky god, and Poseidon is, is the uh, god of the water and the bad god in most um, people's view. And so you have the same sort of analogy with uh, Enki and Enlil. So Enlil is is the uh, uh, is is the god that is associated with um, with monotheism and also known as Adonai in the uh, the polytheist uh, realm as well for our god and Anki as, Anki as the good god and so uh, I think that is 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 a constant that we have to look at that he is a very very high god in charge of one of these cult centers and. Zeus is also the one who causes the flood, just as Enlil is the one who causes the flood in Sumerian mythology. And Poseidon is the one who is the bringer of knowledge to this Atlantean empire, and Zeus is trying to keep the whole empire under rules and regulations, and the same thing happens in Sumeria, where Enki is, is the one bringing knowledge and looking after the betterment of humankind, and Enlil is trying to enslave them to worship them and doing all these different slanders polytheism likes to do with, with our God. And so what he does is, is he marries a person in most legends, and uh, there are different variations of the name. Okay, So in some legends, he marries Clito, or Clito, C-L-E-I-T-O, or in other legends, it's Clymene. But it doesn't really matter if it's a human female. And by the way, just as a sidetrack, so we understand how this Poseidon thing overlaps to the Bible and gets confused, is, is Poseidon also has two other names as an angel, just as some other titans that he created have take the same name. And I'm not talking about Atlas here, which is one of the sons of Poseidon, but some other ones, because Poseidon mated with many other human females. But Poseidon also had the name of Japetus and Iapetus which is the Greek ver version of Japheth. So the polytheists and the Gnostics want us to believe. It's not. They're two different names. I think Japheth may have taken the name of, of uh, the giants as they went and settled in with his descendants with Gog and Magog as being other names that would also be taken in a similar way that the descendants of e Esau 
and, or yeah, Esau and uh, Amalek in particular took the name of the Amalekites. And so I think that is what's really going on. And what they like to do is they like, they like to convert the name to us, just a Greek name for Japheth. And then they overlay all of this polytheist mythology as to what happened to the descendants of Japheth. No, this is different. And Poseidon had those different names. And I think a giant named Japetus or Iapetus was uh, one of the rebellious titans that rebelled and escaped from Tartarus, uh, and uh, same as Gog and Magog, were also uh, Greek giant names. And Gog in Egypt, or in Egypt in Greek, actually means giant or gigantes. Okay, so now he, Poseidon has five twins, five male twins. And so these become the ten kings of the Atlantean Empire. So what happens with that, meaning is if they all were born out of one mother in Atlantis, these kings had to usurp the kingships of these other nations. So they were a warring nation right from the beginning. And so that's where the ten nations come from, and that's where that empire is that, that we had talked about. Now, I have to ask this question, and, and obviously we, we may or may not be able to give a direct answer here, but we, we learn about the seat of Satan, and the seat of Satan literally is where the throne of Zeus is uh, historically. So I believe there's a direct connection between Zeus and that passage in uh, in the Bible about Pergamum uh, and dealing with Revelation. And so, I mean, yeah, you might not see the name Zeus in your Bible, but the seat of Satan, the seat of Satan literally at Pergamum, that's where the altar of Zeus was. So I tend to believe that there's reference to that location to where Zeus was ruling from. When Zeus was on the earth, because Zeus, obviously, uh, I don't believe Zeus is just some name in history. I believe Zeus was actually a physical being, uh, a spiritual being, but that physically manifested. And I, I really believe that Zeus is the physical manifestation of Lucifer on this earth. Now, if if I'm correct on that, and I know I know a lot of people agree with me on that. But if, if I'm correct, that Zeus is Lucifer. When we get over to Poseidon. Because in their mythology, as you just explained, um, they're put up on the same level as if they're the same god. But Zeus is considered the good god. And then in the mythology of Atlantis, Poseidon was the bad god. So is it possible that Lucifer is pulling his changeling qualities and shape-shifting into, to play both roles? Or is it possible that Poseidon really isn't Zeus, but that Poseidon is actually second in command? in the Pantheon. Again, these are tough questions, and I know I, I don't want to stretch the issue too much, but I just want to get your take on this. I think uh, technically Lucifer or Satan would probably uh, put himself over above all of those uh, cult centers and gods of those cult centers, gods of those pantheons. And I would also mention that, um, you know, Zeus uh, reigned from where? Mount Olympus. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, to continue people on geography. I'm just saying that when you talk about the seat of Satan, it's on a mountain, a holy mountain, which is, again, a constant or a pyramid that's a constant as well in terms of where these fallen angels ruled from or these seven cult centers. With There's seven sacred mountains in the world, and that's constant in polytheism, whether it's Taoism or it's Greek mythology. And these mountains are where these gods rule from. So if we understand those as separate nations and you know different sort of uh, uh, fallen angels watchers ruling from there, but having a pantheon that's set up all the same way, and they could also even be all the same gods in the same pantheon, just one rules one area and one rules another area, um, then I think it starts to starts to make some sense. And that's where I lean definitely. I definitely believe that's how it's set up. Absolutely. Um, now, I, obviously, I do want to get into the Ten Kingdoms um, and, and the, the parallels with the end times because I've got some pretty interesting theories on that. Um, but real quick, on the Atlantis idea, historically or even based on myth, but when we get back, how far back do we have to go to see Atlantis actually showing up on a map? When you're trying to pull Atlantis, which I do, into the Genesis account, you're actually pulling it from the polytheist belief into a sooner date than a later date, so that they would take an Atlantean destruction probably back to somewhere between, uh, you know, five to eight thousand BC. 
and some even even further back than that. When you're dealing with even the conservative view, um, the debate generally is that the Earth is somewhere between six to ten thousand years old, um, and I, obviously there's debate there. Um, but you do get into a very strange scenario where you get in Genesis one, where the Hebrew gives a, and there's so much debate about this, and I'm not bringing this up to cause our listeners to fight with each other or to create debate in the comment section. But there's debate as to this passage in Genesis 1 between 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, and it's the earth became formless. That's the other possible translation. The King James Version doesn't say that, but if you look back at the Hebrew words that would go in it, like using strong dictionaries, it, it gives you the possible meanings that you could uh, translate that as and suggest that, that the earth had become void. But I go, like to go back to the original um, uh, Hebrew on it, and it, there's two ways of translating that. And I would also point people to a couple of other verses. Again, um, you know, look to that verse in Ezekiel 26, where the earth is in is in ruins, and that is is in ancient times, uh, which is you know antediluvian and even longer because, and it's talking about the time of of Satan and and his fall. So that's a possible reference to it. Uh, a lot of people also like to use Jeremiah 4, 23 to 26. Um, and again, it talks about the earth being uh, void and formless, but I, I don't really look at that as as a reference to Genesis 1 because it seems to be talking about uh, another time than back then. But I would point to um, I, uh, Psalm 104.30, and I would have people look at that because immediately after, if the word had become void, and in, in verse 2 it talks about the Spirit hovering over the earth. And um, in 104.30, it talks about the creation of the world and the Spirit renewing the earth. And that's the renewal theory that, or the gap theory that people are referring to. So I think there's a strong possibility that that's, the case, and just as there's a strong argument that the people of day six is a significantly different story than the Eden account. And again, I have a two-page, a little over two-page document. If people want to email me or get a hold of me, I'll send that to you because it's, it's a show in itself to cover off that story between six and Eden account is completely different. And I don't believe the Bible is in contradiction. So if you have these two possibilities, you have the gap theory that people like to call it, which we don't know how old the world gets to be. And then you have some time, an unknown period of time between day six and the creation of uh, of Adam in singular. And I'll just leave that as a tidbit. There are some good arguments on both sides. You know, I mean, being a researcher, I, I know there's some great arguments on both sides of the spectrum on that. Um, and, and it's it's edifying to be able to discuss these things because it causes us to think, and it also causes us to really dig into the scripture and the original language for ourselves. Um, maybe maybe we can come back and we can do a show on that, Gary, where we can we can break down uh, your research into that area because I, I think that's fascinating. Uh, even some extremely conservative Christians have referenced back to the works of G. H. Pember, um, who was an extremely conservative Christian theologian, uh, and he wrote the book uh, The Earth's Earliest Ages, uh, which is kind of Odd to hear that coming from a extremely conservative Christian, but we have to remember that what we consider conservative Christians today is based on what we know in American culture. You know, when you go back so far, conservative Christianity held more supernatural views than the church holds today. Oh, absolutely. We've let science interfere with what the Bible actually says, and we just don't let the Bible read for what it says. So we become more skeptical and conservative of that. Um, and, you know, if I didn't find so many issues between the Day 6 people and the Eden account, I may not put as much credence on the gap theory. Uh, but because uh, both of those things answer so many different questions, uh, A, like when did the angelic rebellion happen? And why did it happen? And if these were immortal beings, why would have it happened so quickly, right? So um, just put things in better context for me to, to look at that as a significant possibility. And I have to admit, I, I lean like 99% and leaving that 1% open that um, I'm wrong on it. But I would I'd underline that the only thing that suggests that the world is 6,000 years old is taking the genealogies back to Adam. 
And if Adam uh, is created at a different time than the people created in plural who are nomadic hunters and gatherers and a whole bunch of other differences in the story uh, between day six and Eden two, then all of a sudden we're freed up from these chains of, of when um, the earth was actually created. And because it's not a big deal, right? Does it really matter? As long as we're following the biblical narrative, uh, you know, and there's so many questions that we do have as we start studying these things in Scripture, um, and, and I think the Bible gives us what we need. I just I feel that there should be a dialogue on some of these issues because so many people are raising questions because of certain passages in the Scripture. Now, the other thing I want to I, I kind of want to tap into here, uh, and, and I didn't mean to open a can of worms there. Uh, I know people are definitely wanting to hear that now, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Stay tuned for a future show. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of, when we get back to the idea of Atlantis, I want to steer us back towards that. Um, what was the culture like? I mean, what based on the, the mythology, what would, what would somebody expect to have seen as they entered into this place? I mean, obviously this is before Atlantis was submerged. We're dealing with Atlantis as a epicenter of the cult, the, the, the cult network, if you want to call it that. Um, what would what would it have been like? I mean, what are some of the stories that we hear about Atlantis with the technology and the culture and the system? I mean, what was that like? And again, this is all based on mythology, so I, I don't want to make people upset, but I'm, I'm interested. Uh, when we look at um, the mythology, the two best ones to look at are descriptions of, uh, uh, from Plato and then match that up with people like Homer and Plutarch. Uh, because they talked about Titans, not uh, specifically Atlantis, but Titans as a whole in that whole mythology. And so all of them are pretty much consistent in terms of what they say happened. Um, so understand that when uh, Athens defeated Atlantis in, in, in the battle against Atlantis, that there were Titans fighting uh, for the Athenians. Okay, so at first, after usurping the leadership of these Titan kings, these demigods, these giants who look like serpents, uh, and then uh, afterwards they produced more Nephilim kings. But in the beginning, they call it the Golden Age, and they call it the Age of Judicial Rule by these very powerful, shining Nephilim kings, and that they ruled judiciously and they created peaceful societies. Um, but over time, and after they develop the religions and they develop these technologies, they're, they're, they're able to trade around the world. They're able to communicate around the world. They're able to have flying machines. They're able to do DNA manipulation. They're able to do all the things and more than what we can do today. Uh, and we're told it was just a place of pleasure. And then... The kings, they slowly, because they say the aspects of humanity, and this can happen in two ways, start to overtake these judicious, godlike, good beings who are ruling. Now understand, this is their description. This is not my interpretation. This is what they say, not what I believe. Um, but they say that humanity, uh, by through intermarriage and bloodlines and interaction, gaining power over them with the evil and the good side was was being um, a slowly eaten away. So two things going on. One is is that angels and titans and everybody's affected by the evil of this world. So even if they started off good, they're being affected by the world. And sin is what we know it because the world is sin. Or the second thing is that they're talking about is through the generations, through the different kings coming to power, um, that they were intermarrying more with humans and more bloodlines being interjected and they became more evil all, all the time and that they started to realize that their immortality was waning, which goes back to Genesis 6 again with God intervening and saying, we are not going to uh, permit uh, God's earthly gods to live forever, forever in the flesh on the earth. So he limits lifespan to 120 years, and the original ones, they live for a long period of time, yes, but their bodies die out and they become demons because the spirit doesn't go to sleep and they're not allowed to go into heaven. But the descendants, even though they can live to be a long, age, a long age, they know that they're no longer immortal. And then they start to war. They start to do more black magic. They're trying to do everything they can to create longevity. So this is the elixir of life and immortality that's been perpetuated through the Rosicrucians and 
uh, vampire tales and they drink blood and they do all sorts of abominations and they start to turn against the earth in their wrath. And they're so upset about their, their, that their mortality that this is where hero worship comes from in Greek mythology or in Taoism where the spirit of their hero or their ruler would come back to where they reigned and they used to do sacrifices to them uh, to pacify this angry spirit because uh, he, would, he would come back and haunt the local town or the city that he had ruled over. And so it moves into this debauchery of sexual violations, of destroying and corrupting the earth, of drinking blood, and then they also turn on humans because they can no longer feed the number of giants in the world, that their appetites are so huge. This is according to Enoch, um, that they turn on humans and start to slaughter them and start to eat them. Then they turn on each other, and so they turn this golden age that they call it, Zeptepi, uh, Age of Aquarius, whatever you want to call it, that's the future reference allegory for the, the Golden Age, and they start to war with each other, uh, and then the gods bring on the flood after they put down the rebellion against the gods and, and uh, start all over. That is the how, what happens in the Greek and um, um, polytheist records, and again, look to Plutarch to, to describe that as well in, in particular detail in um, uh, how how that world slides into depravity. That's so interesting, Gary, because you get into this idea that it's it, it's a culture of pleasure, uh, a golden age where we're just it's pleasure, 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 and we see that ta- that that we see that same type of um, behavior when we get into uh, some of the Roman culture, uh, the Romans that worship, and and obviously there there's a lot of parallels between the the gods of the Romans and the gods of the Greeks. Uh, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but the Romans adopted the gods of the Greeks uh, down the timeline. Is that correct? They're, they're the same gods, just different vernacular names. And Ovides is, is the big writer for the Romans who captures a lot of these stories. And in their golden age, it starts off, and you're, you're going to like this, uh, because as an analogy, perhaps, for the end times. So in the Roman version, they start with the golden age, which most people have heard of, and it moves to the silver age, and it moves to the bronze age. Then it moves to the Iron Age of depravity before the flood comes. As we as we look at some of the Roman history and some of the just some of the the dynasties, or I, I, obviously I, some people don't like using the word dynasty when you're dealing with the Romans, but when you're dealing with some of the leaders, the Caesars, and it, they really they had they tried to create this culture of polytheism and pleasure. It was all about polytheism and pleasure and the worship of the gods. And I mean, they took this stuff very seriously. And it was it's making more sense now that we learn about Atlantis and the mythology of Atlantis because it's like they're trying to recreate this. They are. And I don't think, you know, I don't think we're going to see the full recreation until we get into that final notch on the prophetic timeline as we get into the Ten Kingdoms under the Antichrist. And, and I really do think that is going to be literally, I think that's going to be a exactly what was going on in Atlantis, but it's going to be happening in the in the future. Now, as we move into that, because that's that's kind of our we're going to move into that as our as our last segment, but as a transition, um I was talking with with a, a good friend of mine, Chris Pinto. Uh, I had an opportunity to work with Chris Pinto on uh, his latest documentary. And uh, many of you know Chris Pinto. Uh, he produced the series called uh America's Secret Beginnings. And uh, one of the best series of documentaries I've ever seen like all time, I got to say, hands down, Chris Pinto and, and his series on America's Secret Beginnings. If you haven't seen it, folks, it's on YouTube. You can watch it for free. I recommend going over to his website, Adolum Films, and buy the DVDs. They are worth having to share with people. But the thing about this, Gary, is we get into this very strange occurrence with a man by the name of Sir Francis Bacon. And Sir Francis Bacon, there's a lot of a lot of controversy, as you and I spoke before the show, as to his true identity. Now, I lean to the idea that he was Shakespeare, the same person, and, and, and I definitely want your, your feedback on this in a second, but he wrote The New Atlantis. And what's interesting is uh, we, we find out that he was an occultist. He was practicing uh, black magic. We look at his colleagues. Some of his colleagues were wizards, warlocks. I mean, some crazy stuff. But it seems that what he wrote in The New Atlantis was a prophetic outline of what America became. Now, 
let's go ahead and address the idea of William Shakespeare. Um, and then let's talk about Francis Bacon and what he did, what he was involved with, and, and some of these prophetic utterances. I need to, for the listeners, I need to lay a little bit more reference in here from Atlantis because um, it's, it's really, really important, particularly with what you just said. So I already talked about the development of the science and the technology. That's the seven sacred sciences of Enoch the Evil and Freemasonry and craft legends, right? Um, so, and we also know Francis Bacon was a uh, part of secret societies, and uh, we'll get into that in, in, in a second. Um, but the development of these seven sacred sciences were what led to the development of mysticism and black magic, which overtook the Atlantean Empire. It went from good magic, as they would call it, into black magic as in sorcery and necromancy um, aspects. And so this mystical side is the priesthood. This is the Babylonian part. It's always in partnership with the Nephilim-ruled kingships or the Antichrist-type figure of kingships. Okay? And the priests are known as wizards and or magi or as wise ones. Uh, you know all the different names, and that's why you have wizards connected to Francis Bacon. And that's why wizards show up in Atlantean uh, mythology or related ones, whether it's Merlin and King Arthur, because Merlin is the title for a priest and is the partner of King Arthur. Um, that's a whole different story in its in a show in itself. And also you have the Magi and the Wise Ones and the astrologers from Nimrod's uh, uh, empire that comes out of Babel. And you have Hermes, who's the priest and the wise one and the magi, who works with Nimrod in partnership at Babel, and he goes over to Egypt, and he starts the Egyptian religion um, and uh, the Egyptian priesthood. So you see this sort of consistency of this religious aspect, which is also important to understand that in the end time, you have a universal religion that is controlling this uh, end-time empire called Babylon, this is very much what happened with the kings. They were controlled by this mystical wizard sorcery type religion. So now that is backdrop. Let's move into Shakespeare and, and Francis Bacon. So there is a lot of talk that Shakespeare and Francis Bacon uh, are the same individual. And there's, there's some good reasons. I'll just give you a few because there's so many of them. So Shakespeare is the son of a butcher, and he's uneducated, and he writes the great classics of, uh, of that period of time that are even recognized even today. He has a knowledge that is unaccountable for the classics in ancient history. He has a knowledge of the legal system of that time. Everything is perfectly written legalistically right. He has a knowledge of the courts and the royal courts in a way that a commoner wouldn't have. He has the writing style of Oxford, which he never received a formal education, and he uses words um, that are being reinvented and reapplied uh, at that time, and he uses Rosicrucian secret society, occultic symbols that he has no business in understanding, right? He has all of these, and those are just the tip of the iceberg of the things that say, how could Shakespeare have done this? Okay, And you have uh, the name Shakespeare, which everybody thinks uh, is made up. Uh, and it's an allegory. Now, let's just move over to Bacon. And this is, this, this is uh, one of the most powerful people in um, England. And he works and he's trained under John Dee, who is the most famous occultist of, of his era, at least from an English perspective, and uh, actually takes over for John Dee and a lot of the societies and that later on. So when Francis Bacon is young, uh, he is writing things uh, as they go through their sort of elite lifestyles for the courts, and they, they're learning about things, and he becomes a prolific writer. But he doesn't stop this, and he does this when he, when he goes over at an early age, I think in his teens, over to France. And he comes back to England, and he, he wants to continue his writing, but he really can't because he's, he's, he's basically the second in charge or will be the second in charge of in, in England during uh, the time of Elizabeth and uh, um, Henry VIII, um, and even with Mary, I guess, there for a couple of years. So 
he creates this society called the Society of the Helmet. And these are all literary people, and they're going to write things, and they're going to try and bind a common English language, and they're going to reinvent words, and they're going to put out all this stuff. So he employs, I don't know how many, I can't remember, but a significant number of playwrights. And it's called the uh, the Society or the Brotherhood of the Helmet. What's important about that is, is there's a goddess um, and a god that are related to this helmet, and that's Athena and Apollo. And uh, they would wear this helmet over their face, and they would also have a spear. And they would help educate the people and bring knowledge, and they would shake the spear in the face of the evil one or the dragon or or the evil god of the universe, as they would call our god, for teaching the illicit language. And so originally the name Shakespeare um, was hyphenated, shake Spear, and then they joined it together. And so this is the society of literary agents that he creates, which has the name Shakespeare in it. And I think that's the name that's given and adopted by this perhaps even mythical person that they created a history on called Shakespeare. So if it's not Lord Bacon, I don't know where he gets all of this Rosicrucian and uh, ancient history from, because the world of the Globe Theater was, the, was, was, it was known as a Rosicrucian theater. It, and the works of Shakespeare are loaded with the genealogies of the bloodlines of the Nephilim and the kingships. And it's loaded with the allegories of the Nephilim and the giants. And it's loaded with the allegories of both the patriarchal and the matriarchal line. And that's why you have all of these fairies that are in there. And so you even have the king of the fairies, which is uh, King Oberon, which connects back to the Tuatha Danon and through the Celtic kingships, which is, again, another show in itself. But the king of the fairies is married to who? Titandes. That's a female name for Titan. This is all allegory of the dark side and a history with genealogies and bloodlines and hidden history and hidden meanings. And there's no way Shakespeare could have had all of that knowledge. That was a bit of a rant, but that gives you an idea what we're talking about. No, that, that's so important to break down, and I'm glad you brought that up because some people are going to get up on a little uh, on a soapbox and they're going to say, "No, no, Shakespeare was this pauper, basically." And but no, it, it, there's no way. There's no way that this guy Shakespeare, if if the story that goes behind his name, if it's you know if if it was true, he would not have had all this information um, unless he was just sitting around channeling demons all day. Um, but we have evidence to show that yeah, he was channeling demons, but he was Sir Francis Bacon. It makes so much sense. And when you bring up John D, um, and goodness, we could do a whole show on John D for crying out loud. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, goodness, you people don't realize John D has influenced characters in movies, characters in books, but John D was the real deal. I mean, major occult uh, mathematician, uh, occult artist, black magic. I mean, it literally, he would be like the epitome of a wizard, um, extremely trained, and he was a close colleague of Bacon. Now, obviously, we 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 you know we don't have to stretch our minds too far to realize that he they were both involved in in channeling and getting knowledge from some of their rituals and, and, and demonic forces. But Bacon comes out with the New Atlantis idea. And, you know, th- this still blows my mind to this very day, Gary, that he could have written all of this detailed information years and years before the founding of America as a nation of America. Again, obviously, America has always been here. The continent's always been here. But when America became a nation... When it was set up with a with a government, I mean, we're dealing with, and I'm going to say this loosely, but we're dealing with prophecies that are being fulfilled of the New Atlantis with this continent. And we find out that they say, well, oh, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And uh, I mean, all of this occult symbolism and literary reference surrounding America, it's all coming true. And it seems to be pushing that America is going to have a major role in this end time kingdom. But as students of the word of God, we see this end times timeline getting closer and closer and closer where there will be a kingdom of the Antichrist. And it seems that we are dealing with a new Atlantis here. Now, what are your thoughts about the new Atlantis that, that uh, Bacon wrote about and how it's coming to pass? 
let's just move back uh, a little bit. So there was an organization called the Templars that knew about uh, North America, and uh, it was their dream to continue to uh, to discover what was over there and bring it along, and this is a longer-term plan. And what's important about that is even Columbus uh, on his on his uh, main ship bore the uh, the Santa Maria, the uh, Templar flag, and there were one, some of the money behind him going because they knew it was there. They just wanted to get this thing going. So this was part of a Templar dream, but the Templars are overthrown in 1307. So I'm moving quickly to get back into it. They, they form a number of organizations that Francis Bacon inherits um, in the uh, say. 50, I think he was 1540 to about 1625. I think that's when Bacon lived somewhere in that zone. So in that uh, period of time. So these groups are the Freemasonic group are recreated to do the political and the military and media and stuff like that influence. You have the Rothschilds that are created for the banking arm of the Templars. You have the uh, Royal Society, uh, which I'll come back to, which is uh, going to take control of education and develop the seven sacred sciences for the great architect of the universe, or Lucifer, as they like to call him. And you have the Jesuits who need to replace the uh, the uh, Templars inside the Catholic Church as a Catholic military role that works at the front and center of whatever uh, Catholicism is doing. And, of course, you have the Rosicrucians, and you have the Illuminati, both uh, who, who are uh, heavily uh, involved with um, all of the secret societies. And the, the, the Illuminati is, is all about world government and destroying Christianity. And Rosicrucianism is about keeping the Gnostic religion, keeping the legends and the mythology. And it includes alchemy, which, of course, Francis Bacon was. So he wrote several alchemy, alchemy books, for lack of trying to get the other word out, uh, and he finished up with this this alchemy uh, philosophy, which is part of the seven sacred sciences, that goes into the New Atlantis. And the New Atlantis is a book about uh, the end time, or a new golden age, or a new age, or the New Atlantis, as he calls it, which is based upon a society uh, that is a recreation of the Atlantean age, where you have a world government, and you have a world religion that works in harmony with science. And, of course, it's the ancient uh, religion out of Atlantis. It's the Enochian mysticism. It's Babylon. It's polytheism. And that's why it works in harmony with uh, science, because the Royal Society is created to develop the sciences. And these are created by Freemasons and Rosicrucians. And... Francis Bacon is the inspirational founder from his writing of the New Atlantis for the establishment of the Royal Society. Now, getting back to the U.S., so you've got Walter Raleigh, Raleigh who works uh, uh, with uh, Francis Bacon in the development and the ongoing uh, development of the Americas. And, of course, the Jesuits are always, coincidentally, accompanying these ships because they're all working for the same sort of end to develop uh, Brazil and the United States because they have had a twin hope of developing those as role models and springboards for what the end time government and world will look like. And so the, the, the envision of this was is many states um, and 13, which is an occultic number, um, were the original uh, 13 colonies. Uh, no coincidence there, but those it, it 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 actually is a design thing. But just understand they overlay everything with their meanings. Um, and so, this is going to work from a strong federal government with independent states that work together for one common cause. And each of the governments will have um, their own responsibilities, but the central government will. You know, do things like foreign policy and healthcare and education, sort of things that affect everybody. And I know they didn't look at it in quite those terms, but just in modern terms, that was how it was supposed to be set up. And you look at how the U.S. works today and how poorly the EEC is working. So they need to get back to more of a U, UN uh, or a United States model. But that was the springboard and the model. And the U.S. was built to help bring their idea of. The, 
limited democracy, and they don't really care what the form of government is in the end, as long as they get what they want. But it's the United States' manifest destiny, which is their philosophy, their idea, because destiny and fairies are all interlinked, right? Understand that these words that, that, that are used by everyday Americans and Canadians and people around the world are placed and utilized just as fellows are, because a fellow is a, a member of one of these secret societies. So anytime you sing, sing, you sing Jolly Good Fellow, you're singing a secret society song. So anyways, um, they are utilizing the United States as this springboard, uh, and a, their manifest destiny is not only to, to, to be a modern force, but to help usher in world government. Uh, unfortunately, stubborn Christians are in the way. That's the problem. And so they created the United States with a constitution that wasn't designed to protect Christians so much as it was designed to protect their Gnostic religion from the wrath of the Roman Church. And the constitution has been written in a way to be eventually used against Christians, which we're starting to see today. So they're going to use this against us in the end time. And what's interesting about this as a model for world government is, as we had mentioned, that Atlantis had 10 nations as part of its helm of world government, and Daniel in Revelation prophesied ten, a 10-nation 10 empire. And in the late 60s and the early 70s, one of these spring-off organizations that all starts with the Templars and, and Bacon as one of the major influences uh, is the Club of Rome. And these are very high-level bloodlines and, and uh, very high-level, probably pure bloodline Rosicrucians. And they decide that they're going to solve the world problems, and in doing so, they're going to cattle herd everybody into the end time that they have split up into ten empires and nations or groups of nations. So what they're trying to set up is, is ten economic zones, ten trading blocks, ten spheres of influence, ten groups of nations, however you want to call it, to be this Atlantean Empire. So all of this has been planned for such a long period of time, and I've just sort of skimmed top to bottom. So you can jump in anywhere where you want to dig deeper on this, Justin. So when we get to the scripture, we get into Daniel and Revelation, and we, we see that there's going to be ten kings. Um, and the kings are going to be working underneath the Antichrist and his rule. This is, this is one of those things that's not debatable. There's no interpretive challenges here. Um, any Bible-believing Christian cannot refute this. Now, what it appears to be is that the powers of this world, which we know that Satan is the, the prince of the power of the air, we know he's the god of this world, according to the New Testament, what we see here is that the same demonic forces that were in power when Atlantis was, the historic Atlantis, the, what we're dealing with is the guidelines, the structure of Atlantis is coming back for the, the rule of the Antichrist, literally. That's that's what we're seeing here. Absolutely, and I think just, at, and although we don't really uh, know about this, although perhaps it's Orion, um, who is the leader like Antichrist in the antediluvian world. Um, and Orion is connected to the flood story in the Bible, as well as in Greek mythology and around the world, whether you're looking at the belts of the pyramid, which are, uh, in their belief system, a monument to the antediluvian world and their great heights that they reach to, or it's the Orion that is uh, chasing after the daughters of the Pleiades, and the Pleiades um, is an allegory of, of a celestial star system where the two or three, depending on which legend you're talking about, stars hit the oceans, which um, kick off the flood catastrophes, and Orion is the hunter that's hunting those two uh, or three daughters, and Pleiades is the daughter of Atlas, who is the king of Atlantis of the main center. And so when you talk about Orion and Pleiades, they are in all the mythology stories around the world. And in fact, at Babel, uh, where they're building uh, the, what I believe was the pyramid, because pyramid, tower, or ziggurat meant the same thing in the ancient world, built a little bit differently, but still trying to create uh, a sacred mountain, um, when you get into the Sumerian, which they said Babylon was, uh, Babel was built at Eridu, and in the Aramaic, Armenian um, um, mythologies, they have this temple built at the base of the Tower of Babel, and similarly, they have the same 
temple built in the Aztec and the Chula and some other Central American um, mythologies about the building of the Tower of Abel, and when you read them, are almost identical, again, from a polytheist perspective. But they had this temple at the base dedicated to the meteors that started the uh, the flood catastrophe that hit the ocean's waters, and those were the Pleiades in all of those legends around the world. Those are just unaccountable um, coincidences, but we also need to understand that in the Bible, uh, there's connections to Pleiades and the uh, and the Orion to a flood-like catastrophe, and that comes up in Job 38, Job 9, Amos 5, and in a few more areas in the Psalms. So I think there's a connection there that goes back to it. So yes, there would be a Antichrist-type figure uh, that ruled the Antediluvian world. You have a false prophet-type figure that's allegorized in the wizards, and you have the seven sacred sciences and technology being developed, and you have this ten-nation empire, and you have the same thing that happens with the spirit of the Antichrist and the spirit of the beast, the post diluvian world, starting with Hermes and Nimrod at Babel trying to do the same thing. And anytime you have a kingship, he has royal bloodlines that goes back to, uh, for the most part, to the Nephilim, and they're trying to recreate the same thing all the way through. They just haven't been successful because Restrainer is holding them back. But in the end time, I believe we're going to see these direct connections back to the antediluvian epoch, back to uh, what some of the things that polytheism tells us, and we're going to tell us find that it matches up perfectly with Bible prophecy. Now, the, the thing that really sticks out to me here, and uh, I just want to say, if anybody's listening and you have not heard the original trilogy that Gary Wayne and I did, uh, go back in the archives, and it's called the Nephilim Conspiracy. And we, we covered a lot of really interesting information, uh, which is all outlined in Gary's book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Um, the thing about this, though, that, that gets my attention is when we, when we think about the bloodlines and the Nephilim nobility, um, when we go back to Atlantis, uh, we had the Nephilim set up as rulers and uh, of some of the different, uh, the different uh, satellite campuses, per se, or the satellite nations. So if the Nephilim were the rulers there, you know, this is what's amazing about your book, Gary, is that you explain how secret societies and the descendants of giants plan to enslave humankind. And I, I you know, they're so creative. They're, they're, they're so beguiling. Uh, people are enslaved and don't realize it. And I think that's what the Bible explains is going to be taking place in the last days is that mankind will be enslaved by Satan and they won't even view it as being enslaved. They will have been given over to the strong delusion. And so, People have to understand that the enslavement is not going to look like enslavement on the surface to the people who are enslaved. I mean, even go back to the Hebrews, uh, the, the, the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, when they were in the land of Goshen, after a while they became enslaved. And even when God delivered them from Egypt, how many of them kept saying, we want to go back? We want to go back. They didn't see it as being enslaved. And so that's what's so interesting about this is you point out in your book how they're, they're, planning to enslave mankind under the beast system, basically, but man is not going to see it as being enslaved. Now, the point I want to make here is that the Nephilim nobility, as we've already pointed out in past shows, and people, you'll read about it. Ladies and gentlemen, you can go read about this in Gary's book, but the Nephilim nobility are the leaders. Now, some of the, the world leaders, they're, they're more of a watered-down pedigree than others. They have less amount of seraphim or nephilim or giant dna whatever you want to call it you know you can call it what you will but it seems to me that there will be a rise of more pure bloodlines of the nephilim now i I think they're already here i just think that they haven't surfaced in the limelight or they haven't manifested in their true form because i think that the nephilim do have the ability to have a change in quality um some of them depending on how pure they are but the idea would be that these 10 kings in the bible could very possibly, I mean, and this is just going back to the parallels with Atlantis. It's just going back to those parallels, but it's very possible that the 10 kings that give their, their power to the Antichrist or that he gives them power and they rule under him, it's very possible that they are going to be very pure-blooded Nephilim. It's a distinct possibility. I think that these 10 kings, uh, just as the Antichrist, has to be connected back to the, to the Nephilim. So you have, they are either descendants with bloodlines, or they are new cre- recreations through copulation, or there's going to be cloning through 
uh, ancient blood, like uh, we hear of uh, other, uh, they've discovered, I think, Osiris's tomb, or Akhenaten's tomb, and um, Nimrod's tomb. I think, you know, there's some thoughts out there about that. Uh, or the other possibility is, is maybe some of these are in stasis, but that's getting too far out. Well, well, they're not. They're they're in stasis in underground tubes, or uh, for however how long. I do believe that these t- these ten kings um, from one of these sources are going to be created this way, and it's just a matter of which way they're going to be. But if we go sort of literally to, or they're going to be possessed, which was the other one. There'll be like an avatar concept, um, which is a, a distinct possibility. But I also think there'll be bloodlines, or there'll be nephilim. Um, because the abyss is going to be open, and all of the uh, fallen angels that um, were impassioned are going to be back with us again. So everything is in play. We just don't know which one is going to be like the days of Noah. I mean, because the days of Noah could also mean just like it was with Nimrod and Hermes at Babel, because Noah was still alive then. Um, They're very, very similar. The outcome's kind of similar in terms of what they were doing. But somehow, some way. Nephilim are going to be uh, represented in these king rulers and in the Antichrist. Now, you mentioned avatars, and I want to go back to something that you stated earlier in the show where uh, the Nephilim, knowing that they were going to die eventually, their bodies were going to die, they worked really hard, they got really vicious, they were drinking blood, doing all sorts of uh, just abominations unto the Lord uh, in their search for eternal life because they wanted to try to preserve their life on this earth so that they didn't have to get disembodied. Now, in that idea, because that takes us right up into, and you mentioned the Rosicrucians and others, but that takes us up to the idea of transhumanism, but in a different area of transhumanism than some people might think. Oftentimes we say transhumanism, and people get the idea of robots and microchips, and and, and I believe microchips can have a very big role to play in this. But you see, the movies have done a disservice to transhumanism because they've tried to create this idea of robots and um, artificial intelligence as a machine, but I'm thinking of it more on a carbon-based life form genetic level and getting into the Avatar technology. See, people don't realize that the movie Avatar was, uh, you know, the James Cameron film. They don't realize that James Cameron is a major advocate for transhumanism. This is very – just just Google James Cameron uh, transhumanism. He's a huge advocate for it. You don't see any of this in Titanic, but you see all of his belief system and his goals and hopes – presented in the movie Avatar. And if if there's never been a movie that's worth watching for the sake of research and seeing how they're putting it out there, Avatar is that movie. People got so engulfed in Avatar. I saw interviews with people on the internet. They would go and see it night after night after night in the theater, Gary. And never has there been a movie, I think, that has mesmerized so many people to where they were addicted to it. People did interviews after the fact, and they said, I would leave the theater depressed because I couldn't live in that fantasy world anymore. I had to come back the next night and re-enter into it. I've never heard of a movie like this. It's, it's, it's almost like a form of bewitching or witchcraft. I mean, they're talking about doing something that is, is uh, a creation of recreating um, immortality. Like you're talking about just the survival of the spirit and the physical shell being just a vessel, right? Right. And so this is this is a step way beyond demon possession for these spirits. This is about living and making contact and controlling the body and not sharing the body uh, as uh, as a vessel. And this is a very very um, sort of little known sort of understanding of uh, a couple of key passages in the, in the New Testament. And um, let me just. Uh, it's as an extension of this avatar concept, because this is the Rosicrucian concept, that uh, that avatars are people that they speak to, but these avatars are always looking to possess bodies and, and own these bodies, and that's been behind what they believe a lot of the genetic and uh, transhuman um, experiments that you've, uh, and research that you referred to are behind. So if we go to Jude 1.6, and of course anybody who's really familiar with uh, the Nephilim story, um, they go to Jude 1, 6, and, and we see where the, these angels, they, they left their inhabitants, and, uh, and it's the word habitant that I want to focus on. And habitant um, comes back to the Greek word oikaterion, uh, which is like, putting, it's like, it's like 
these angels left their, uh, their, their spiritual realm, they put on physical clothes, took off their spiritual clothes, and went into this vessel uh, of a body in the physical realm. Um, and you, if you look at the, the definition of Goikaterium, it is a dwelling space or a body for a spirit. It's a very, very important word, because if you go back to 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 2, it talks, it's the only other place where you have the Greek word oikaterian used in the New Testament again. And it's got to do with the, the spiritual inhabitant or the spiritual house of, uh, of God that we're groaning and desiring to put on those clothes to be in, in heaven, in that house. And that's where the word oikaterian is used, is in the house, in that application. So it's only used twice in the Bible, and again, that's if defined as, as putting your clothes on. There's a couple other Greek words, or taking your clothes off. There are a couple of very, very close Greek words there, enemu, or endo, I can't quite remember what they are, uh, but oikaterian is, is what the clothes that, that they're putting on and off. And so that's the avatar concept. And if you extend what we're talking about to ideally what they would love to do in the Avatar concept is create these human vessels like they have in the Avatar movie for these demons that are going to be released or these fallen angels that are going to be released to dwell and be the ten kings and other rulers in the end time. Absolutely. Do you remember uh, about a week ago? It might have been two weeks. I don't remember. I had sent a video to, uh, to the Remnant Revolution team uh, and I, I didn't I didn't post it on Facebook, but I had sent it to him via email. And then Chad Riley tagged me in the video when he put it up. And it shows this technology that they're already working on right now. Uh, I have not looked deep into the technology, but they show that they've already got the science and that they're working on this. And basically, it's a big room of all these little cells. It's like a tank or a tube, but there it's like a miniature tube, and it's recreating the birth sack of the mother. And they explain in the video and, and again, they're, they're not, this is not a conspiracy video. They're, they're showing you the science that they're, they're excited to announce. They're saying, this is good. Look what we're doing. And they, they go to show that you can take, they can literally create babies in a lab absolutely um, without bringing two bodies together. And then they grow the baby in this tank. They've got an artificial umbilical cord uh, where they're pumping in artificial uh, nutrients to the baby. And it's floating inside of this tank of liquid, which is an artificial birth fluid. Uh, it's unbelievable. And they're explaining that in this process, parents that want children, you know, maybe they can't have children or, or whatever the story may be. These people can actually decide what they want. I want a boy. I want a girl. Uh, I want his genes to be this, that or the other. I want them to have this disposition or this benefit or this color. eye. these are all things that they're actually able to do now. And they're showing that they can grow babies without any mother and father to give birth to them. They can literally grow these things in a lab all with alchemy. And what's important there is, is they don't, I don't believe that they'll have, although they're going to work on it with AI, but I don't think they'll, they'll crack it. I don't think they have the ability to create a spirit. No. Artificially, right? I'm with you on that. So they need to put that spirit in, right? Yep. So, and again, I just looked it up just uh, uh, while you were talking, and just so I've got it right for the listeners, is, is Oikaterian dwelling place or body for the spirit. That's an avatar concept. It's a O Y K A Y T A. Well, this is how, you, at least phonetically, how you would pronounce it. O Y K A Y T A Y R E E O N. Oikaterian. And so, if you look into Strong's, you can look that up. And when you look under habitation in June one six, and in house in uh, five two, Second Corinthians five two, and the clothes were. Uh, uh, endu, E-N-D-U-O, and unclothed is ekduo, E-K-D-U-O, and it's putting on and off in reference to these spiritual and physical bodies. And that's what this is. This is the recreation of that. Yeah, and the reason why I got into that is is I wanted to find, and, and somebody said, look at this word, and, and I wanted to find a better connection on, on the changeling quality. Why angels have the ability to take a gender and have a changeling quality? It's because they put on a different set of clothes when they enter into the physical realm. And this is, this is how they have this changeling quality. And they're affected by 
the physical realm when they put on the physical clothing, just as you're affected by the spiritual realm when you put on the spiritual clothing. And it answers, again, how Nephilim uh, are able to have the changeling quality and we're able to have sex, even though it was a violation against creation. So what we're dealing with here is the fallen angels can take on different forms. We know this. Uh, the Bible tells us that you could even be entertaining an angel unaware. So angels can take on the form, and, and you could you know, be talking to somebody who you think is a human, but it's actually an angel. But with a Nephilim, the Nephilim are going to die. They're not eternal, and they desire to live and live and live in a physical body. And I think that's why we have so many cases of demon possession, because they desire to be in an actual body or the clothes, as you just broke down in the Greek. And so what this is, is this is creating a hybrid body that has no spirit. We're dealing with literally a soulless body made up of biological material. And then once these things are birthed, you know, when they, when they pull them out of the tank, and again, these things can grow really fast. All they have to do, since they're doing all of this with, with science, they can speed up the process. Um, in my opinion, they'd be able to speed up the process and have these bodies turned out at whatever age they'd want to have them turned out, and then boom, they get taken over by the Nephilim, which are thousands of years old. These are these are old, ancient souls of, of the Nephilim. Now, if this takes place, we now have physical bodies created specifically for the Nephilim or the demons, whatever you want to call them, ladies and gentlemen. And these could very potentially be the bodies who are set up as the kings who are placed under the Antichrist as the Ten Kings. So I think this is fascinating. I've been watching a TV show with my brother called The 100. And The 100, very interesting show. Uh, it starts off where there's a big cataclysm on Earth, and you've got these people living up in a space center, basically up in space. They're in orbit. They've got a whole colony. And some things start to happen. They have to send the children. They end up sending the children down to the Earth, but... They, they don't know if it's going to work out because there's all this radiation, they're told. They don't know if they'll be able to survive the Earth because of the radiation from the cataclysm that took place so many years earlier. Well, I'm not going to spoil the show, but when you fast forward into the latest season, which I, I believe it's season three, and we, ju we just finished season three, the ruler on the Earth is called the commander. And what's interesting is that when the commander dies... They go and they do a ritual and they remove this piece of artificial intelligence. It's like a biological chip that goes inside of, uh, it's like the back of the neck into the, the, I guess the base where the spine meets the brain. And they, they're teaching their people that whenever a commander dies, they have to take out this chip and then they have to do a ritual to put that same chip into the next commander. And they're teaching them that the spirit lives on in this chip. Now, what, what I think is really interesting about this, and, and there's so much occult, I mean, we could really break this down, getting into occult knowledge and alchemy and, and, and what they're really doing in this TV show. But the thing that gets my attention here is that they believe the spirit is in that chip of the commander and then the commander and the commander so far back. But I think about this new technology my dad was telling me about. I don't know if you've heard of this, Gary, but uh, some of the biggest um, memory companies, memory is in dealing with storage, uh, digital storage. They're working together. Uh, they're basically working together to create this type of system where all your memories can get recorded into a DNA, like a strand of DNA. If I'm not mistaken, that's how he explained it to me. So they can, like, like you go on your computer, you find all your photos, all your memories, all this stuff that you've experienced, and they're working on a technology now where you can save it all or store it all on this type of memory that gets then put into your body as DNA. I mean, this to me, this sounds like science fiction. If this wasn't being talked about by the big companies out there, the big digital uh, computer companies, I would never believe it. Google's part of this. Google's part of this. I know there's a group of uh, companies, but what you're really talking about is the advancement that most people don't understand, and it has the ability to almost create anything, um, and it's called quantum mechanics. But uh, this this quantum computer, there's four or five of them in the world now, uh, it makes a supercomputer look like a calculator from the early 1970s, and, and I'm being nice to it. Um, they have the ability over 10 times now, with the last numbers I heard, that they can, uh, the, the quantum capability of this uh, computer has the ability to record every particle in the universe more than 10 times. 
and they keep adding to it all the time. And so it has the ability, I mean, we can't understand what it, uh, what this can do because take a supercomputer that would take like 500 years to calculate something, this thing can do it in less than a second because they're trying to create a um, number of things. One of them is artificial intelligence and uh, the uh, recording of uh of all information, period, whether it is, as we understand it today, as a memory, which we can't reach out and touch, or it's something that is physical. They're reaching into both realms. And they also have the ability, if you carry that further, with quantum mechanics to change things because it's dealing with all the different universes. And it deals with time because we're dealing with dimension. You're also dealing with time. So, and, 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 and I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but what I do know is, is uh, to make this computer work, they have to keep it so cold, there's nothing in the universe that could keep it that cold to function, but they've been able to create the temperature to do this. And this is also connected in this type of computing system in with CERN. And so all of these developments are going in a similar direction, um, and which I, I think is the end time. And I think it's very, very similar ideas and technologies that would have happened, uh, you know, before the flood and in, in Atlantis. And so when we're talking about technology that went beyond what we have today, uh, we're probably getting in the same zone. It's just that most people don't see the technology that they're holding back. Now, this, this computer that you're talking about here, th- this is kind of interesting because it, it links back to the, the show, uh, The 100. And, and ladies and gentlemen, if you think that we're just speculating based on a TV show, no, we're, we're actually showing that, that I believe what they're doing with, with TV shows is they're telegraphing their punches. They are. They're desensitizing us to what they're working on. They're preparing us for what they're going to do. Exactly. That way, when it does surface in the real world and they're offering this, it's not a shock. Oh, hey, that's been planted in my mind somewhere. And oh, it's no big deal. And now the thing is, Gary, is that in the show, um, they this artificial intelligence uh, it's like a hologram of a woman she's basically the mind in the machine and they've got but she appears to people but she can only appear to you if you've taken one of the servant chips now i'm not that's not what they call it but that's what i'm calling it so you have you basically have these little chips with the infinity symbol on it they it looks like a little gel tab and once you swallow that chip you become part of the hive and you can see the you see the woman in red and she basically works through everything and she she's like an omnipresent uh, being, but she's only able to be omnipresent in locations where people have ingested the chip. And so what's interesting about that is that's basically the representation of the main computer or the quantum computer you're talking about. And then everybody who takes the upload or takes the chip or the implant, whatever you want to call it, they're now linked into that hive system. And this, this lines right up with what I believe the Mark of the Beast technology will be utilizing. Oh, sure. Because once you take that, I mean, you're linked to that quantum computer you're linked to that system, and therefore you're controlled. And whether or not they fulfill that or not, I think it would be limited to, to who they wanted, to probably people who descend back to the giants. Because what they're offering and why people will take the mark, not just to survive, but to take the mark, is, is I believe they're going to offer what Satan promised in the Garden of Eden, that you can be like God. And, and there's two aspects to being... Uh, a god in their belief system. One is immortality, so this will offer continual bodies and immortality outside of God. And two is is knowledge and the um, discipline and understanding of knowledge and enlightenment so that you harness the knowledge for good, which is the second aspect of, of godhood in their belief system. That's what they're going to offer. Well, it's very clear uh, through our discussion tonight that we have seen uh, basically, the, the rising up of the New Atlantis, we're seeing the same uh, belief systems and the, even dealing with the Nephilim and the hierarchy and the sciences, the education and just the whole the whole structure of Atlantis. We see that that is being set up right now as we move into this end time scenario. You know, you think about it and you say, you know, do you want to be offered immortality or do you want to die? What do you think most people who haven't researched this properly are going to choose? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Most people want to live. Yeah. Now, Gary, I know we could keep going on this topic. I <laughs> uh, definitely want to steer everyone back over again to all the shows we've done together. We've done the Nephilim Conspiracy. We've gotten into the Jesuit Conspiracy. Uh, we got into the Antichrist and the Gates of Hell. 
Um, definitely go back to the archives, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, wealth of information on all the shows we've done together with Gary Wayne. But I also want to make sure that I steer everybody over to Genesis6Conspiracy.com again. Uh, that's Genesis6Conspiracy.com. And there you'll see, uh, goodness, just on the website alone, Gary gives away tons of information from his book. Uh, that's one thing that we love about Gary. I, I was actually having a conversation with BDK last night on the phone, and there's something that sets Gary apart from other authors. And I'm, I'm not trying to toot your horn, Gary, but I, I just I have to say this. Gary does a number of interviews, and Gary gives the information away. He doesn't get on and just give you a little sneak peek. He actually gets on, and he breaks out information from his book. So... Most authors will get on. They'll just want to give you a little tidbit. But Gary doesn't do that. Gary is all about getting the information out. He wants to open discussion with people. And when you get his book, you're going to find so much information that he's compiled over 30 years of work into. So I, I really want to encourage everyone to check out Genesis6Conspiracy.com. You can find his book there, but you can also find excerpts from the book. You can find so much information there. And uh, Gary, it's, it's just it's such a pleasure having you on because you come on and you bring up so much interesting information that you've researched, things that we can validate with history. We get into even some of the myths and the belief systems and how they correlate with the end times. And uh, it's, it's just so awesome to have you on Genesis6Conspiracy.com. Remember, it's the number six. You will not be disappointed. This is one of those books that is a must have for every Christian researcher. I mean, I can't even tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of those books Man. Now, Gary, uh, some people want to get an autographed copy. Are you still offering that as an option? I am. So go to www.genesis6conspiracy.com. Go to buy now, then buy from author. And if you want it personalized in any way, uh, you can put information in uh, how you would like it personalized or ship to another person as well. Or I'll just do a personalization myself. So uh, easily done that way. And uh, again, uh, my books are fairly readily available. They're available through Amazon, Amazon.com, Amazon.c, Amazon.uk, in Australia, all around the world, BarnesandNoble.com, through the Barnes & Noble stores if you want to order it there. You can also order it through a Christian bookstore as it's distributed by Send the Light Distribution and Ingrams, and also through a secular bookstore if you want to do it from your local independent bookstore as well. So fairly readily available. And for those who want it in Kindle format, it's also available in Kindle format. And on my website, you can also connect to Amazon and to Barnes & Noble and to Kindle. Awesome. Well, Gary, thank you again so much for coming on The Fourth Watch. It's never a boring conversation. I mean, anytime we get together, it's just so much. I mean, I, we find ourselves even talking over each other sometimes because we have so much to say. <laughs> I love it. Like, I, I love it. It's never a dull moment with you, Brother Gary. Uh, man, from the Fourth Watch Radio Network, thank you so much. God bless you, brother, and uh, I hope you have a great. Uh, I know you're on vacation right now, and I just I hope it's it's extremely blessed. We look forward to having you on again very soon. Well, thank you very much. I've so much enjoyed being here, and uh, uh, and you're correct. There's just the conversations. Anytime you and I get together, it's just a uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of, and uh, we talk about so many interesting things. So hopefully, the audience heard some things tonight that that they liked and uh, maybe raises their curiosity a little bit. So, Gary, God bless you, brother. Have a great night, and we'll talk soon. Well, that was a lot to think about, and I always enjoy talking with Gary. I now want to leave you with some words of edification. There's a lot going on right now, and I think we can all agree that the world is confused. And among the confusion, there's a lot of strange emotions about many of the current events. This particular word of encouragement will be timely, but at the same time, I believe it will be timeless as well. With the elections on the brink, people are feeling the need to identify with their party or even more specifically, their candidate. With the Black Lives Matter situation, many feel that they need to identify with their race. And this even goes for both sides. Likewise, people feel the need to identify with all manner of things from sport teams to music groups. On the surface, these are all things that you have the choice to support or not to support. Some people even identify themselves with their jobs. It's even extremely commonplace. I mean, when you first meet someone, it's not unusual to be asked what you do for a living. But the fact that we all have to face is that all of these things can and will let you down eventually. I mean, you identify with these things and they become part of your identity. And it can actually set you up for failure. I mean, at some point, You'll get upset with your president and realize he or she wasn't the person you thought they were. 
or you realize that Black Lives Matters is actually a government psyop created by liberal white globalists to control people and stir up division. Or you have a favorite team that has a horrible season. Or how about you make a mistake on the job and it affects your feeling of self-worth. And it may even cause you to get fired. I remember a time when I found my identity in writing songs. I would work so hard to write and record a song. And when I couldn't hit a certain note or I had a bad recording session, I felt like a total failure. I remember having bad band practices and feeling worthless for the rest of the night. This was a result of me improperly placing my identity. I actually read a story recently about a professional baseball player who had a bad season and he even got injured. He goes on to explain the pain and the emotions of not being able to perform the way he had always performed. It destroyed him emotionally. He had found his identity in his career and the Lord took it away from him for a season. The point is we all identify with people movements, careers, or a number of things this world has to offer. But everything will eventually let you down at some point. As Christians, we're actually called to have our identity in Christ. First of all, we see in the creation account in Genesis 127 that God created us in His image. When we get to Jeremiah 1.5, God tells us that He knew us before He formed us in the belly. So God actually knew us before we knew ourselves. That's more than anyone can say to you on this earth. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So if we are made new by Christ, the old will pass away. This is important in checking yourself. 1 Corinthians 12.27 declares that we are the body of Christ. Each of us are members. Think about it like this. The organs in your body all identify with your body. They work together as one system and even as one identity. Likewise, as a member of the body of Christ, your true identity is in Christ. I want to take you to Colossians 3.1. It says that if ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So we're told to seek the things which are above. It doesn't say to seek the things that are of this world. It says seek those things which are above. Now, the question I have for everyone listening right now, what are you seeking? We tend to identify with the things that we seek the most. Let me say that again. We tend to identify with the things that we seek the most. So I ask you, what are you seeking the most? I remember a time where I got invited to someone's house. Some of you may remember this story. He was a boss of mine at the time. And a friend of mine and I went over to his house and we opened up the pantry. And it was loaded with bottles of vodka, the cheap $10 bottles, the plastic bottles. And I remember thinking, man, he loves vodka. I mean, he had cases and cases and cases He had more vodka than anything in that pantry. And then when I got into his living room, he had pornography everywhere. I mean, stacks of DVDs. And so I asked him, I said, Joel, why do you have all this? He said, well, I've got a membership to the pornography club. And he was getting pornography mailed to him every month in bulk. And it would stack up in his living room. And I asked him about the vodka. He said, well, that's what I like. That's what I like. So I buy it in quantity. I always want to have the things that I want, is what he said. The things that we chase after, the things that we seek the most, that's what we tend to place our identity in. And as Christians, I just want to say that our identity is not in our political candidate of choice. Our identity is not in our job. Our identity is not in our race or the color of our skin. As Christians, our identity is in Christ Jesus. Now, the last passage I want to take you to is Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 22 through 24. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Let me say that last part again. 
that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There is nothing in this world. There is nothing this world will ever be able to offer you that has been created in righteousness and true holiness. I need this kind of renewing every day. It talks about being renewed in the spirit of your mind. I need this renewing every day of my life because we live in a time where there are more distractions than anything else. You see, ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, we don't need to identify with things that have no promise. We don't need to be swayed by the desires we once had in this flesh. We don't need to be swayed by the desires that we're tempted with in this culture. And we surely don't need to be swayed by the things that the culture tells us is right or wrong. We are to have our true and lasting identity in Jesus Christ, and he should be our main focus. This means putting off old conversation that's corrupt. This means operating in a spiritual realm and not in the physical. This literally means stepping up and operating as members of the body of Christ and not putting our hope or our identity in anything else. I'm not saying that we need to go hide under a rock. I'm saying that we have to take spiritual inventory and we have to realize who or what we truly identify with in this life. It is every man's choice, but we were created for higher and greater things than the temporal things of this world and culture. People will always be let down by the things of this world if they've placed their hope and their identity in those things. Your job, your political parties, your social movements, your friends, your talents, your treasures, and the list goes on. If I fail at something in this world, I'm okay with that because that's not my identity. At the end of the day, I know my identity is in Christ alone. He created me in his image. He knew me before I knew myself and he has sanctified me with his blood. And in that, I want to live a life that pleases him. And I don't ever want to share any of my identity with anything that will ever let me down or cause me to stumble or furthermore, even cause me to lose my focus on the things which are above. Until your identity is in Christ alone, friends, you will always be let down by this world. Live to the higher calling, which is in Jesus Christ. If you're listening right now and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, as your personal Lord and Savior, and you haven't accepted his holy sacrifice on the cross to pay for your sins, it's absolutely impossible for you to have a solid understanding of his word. It's impossible to find protection from the demonic realm and the days that are fast approaching, friends. And furthermore, it's impossible to have peace with Yahweh Elohim, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua. But here's the good news. You can start anew right now. You can repent of your sins and have the wages of your sins paid in full. Now is the time to repent and turn away from your sins and make right with the will of God. You see, the Bible declares that we don't know what tomorrow holds, so we must take action with the time that we have right now. Repentance is the first step. This means turning 180 degrees from your past thoughts, actions, and lifestyles that are in opposition to the Most High God. Because of Jesus Christ Yeshua and his once and for all sacrifice, you can be forgiven of your iniquity and every sin you've ever committed. Yahweh is a jealous God, but he's also rich in mercy. And tonight, if you're willing to admit your wrongs and repent, he's willing to show you that mercy right now, friends. The wages of our sin is death, but tonight we can receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. But as it says in Romans 6.23, Only through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's no other way to come to God, folks. There's no other way to get salvation. You can't earn your salvation by good works. Fact is, Jesus Christ is the only way. Every other way, folks, leads to hell. There's no authentic way to the Father but Jesus Christ Yeshua. I'm so thankful that God sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross a living sacrifice and shed his sinless and perfect blood to pay the debt of our sins and the ability 
to be seen as blameless before God on that day of judgment. Let today be the beginning of your communion and peace with God as you're filled with the Holy Spirit and begin putting on the armor of God and growing into an intimate relationship with Him. It's the will of God that you don't perish, but rather that you repent and enter into a relationship with Him based on His terms. If you're not sure of what God's terms are, I want to challenge you to start reading your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, get one and learn firsthand what God expects from you. Christ is our only hope, friends, and my prayer is that you believe on Him tonight. That's the most important part of the show and by far the most important decision you will ever have to make in this life. Amen. It's been an interesting adventure tonight, and I hope you've all enjoyed this broadcast. If you ever miss a show or would like to go back and re-listen to an old one, every show is archived in high-quality streams on my website, fourthwatchradio.blogspot.com. That's the number 4, T-H-W-A-T-C-H-R-A-D-I-O dot B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com. Fourthwatchradio.blogspot.com. There you'll find every broadcast dated and summarized for your convenience. Be sure to scroll all the way down on each page and click on the words Older Posts to be taken to more pages of archived shows. You can also find my shows broadcasted by the Fourth Watch Radio Network on Shoutcast, Spreaker, iTunes, or if you have an iPhone, iPad, or Android, you can download the Fourth Watch Radio Network app and enjoy easy streaming. For higher quality broadcasts, stay tuned in via fourthwatchradio.blogspot.com for all the latest shows. Like us on Facebook and feel free to add my personal page as well. If the Fourth Watch is ministered to you and you would like to help support this ministry, you can follow the link on our website. I bid you all a week filled with grace and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you all next week. God bless and good night. You're listening to The Fourth Watch with Justin Fall on the Fourth Watch Radio Network. Mm-hmm.